I'm at an age when it's very easy to ramble in situations where I should be stating some important truths as precisely and clearly as is humanly possible. Now, with the subject I'm tackling today, I feel I could literally talk for hours without even taking a breath. There's so much to be said. So I'm praying that God will help me to respect your need for time to do other things, but also that you'll be able to find the time to hear what I've done my best to condense down into a fairly short sermon. My subject is the cornerstone. Most Christians would understand this is a term used in the Bible for Jesus, and in particular, for his teachings. In one reference at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, his teachings are described as the entire foundation on which we should build our lives, and presumably our churches. This passage is also the one that most clearly identifies the teachings of Jesus as being the foundation, not just a name or a theological statement about Jesus. And it links disobedience to those teachings to spiritual destruction, as opposed to obedience, which will result in spiritual survival. The group who hear those teachings and do not obey them is destroyed. And, Jesus says, with great authority and great seriousness, great is the fall of it. In another passage, the writer refers to the rest of the Bible, that is, to the apostles and the prophets, as being the rest of the foundation for our faith. But that too states that Jesus himself is the cornerstone. This is the passage that the actual word cornerstone is taken from. Finally, there's another passage where a few translations say that Peter was referring to Jesus as the capstone on the top of an arch, the piece that holds all the rest up. Although even here, most translations still say cornerstone. But in each case, the lesson is the same. Jesus, and in particular, the teachings of Jesus, is the one piece that is absolutely indispensable. Without him, everything else falls apart or becomes chaos. Someone has suggested that a proper Christian understanding of a cult is a group that purports to represent Christianity and yet it leaves out something which is absolutely essential for salvation. So, what if you had a group calling themselves Christian, but they left the cornerstone, Jesus, out of their message? Do you think it could be said that they've left something out which is essential for salvation? Remember, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father except through me. That verse is often used to condemn all of the religions in the world apart from those claiming to be Christians. But then Jesus says, well, why do you call me Lord, Lord, but still you refuse to obey the things I've told you to do. Now that one is clearly addressed to people who do call themselves followers of Jesus, but they have still refused to obey him. Jesus further says, the words that I speak unto you will judge you in the last days. Well, sounds like he's saying that it's impossible to be saved in the last days when we stand before the judgment seat of Christ without putting him and everything he stood for first in our lives right now. And someone comes along and tells you and me it doesn't really matter if you obey Jesus or not because the stuff he said was really never meant to be followed. Well, at least not by non-Jewish believers. And remember, a cult has been described as a group that leaves out and essential for salvation. There's a lot of room for differences of opinion on almost any number of issues between Christians. But if you leave out an essential, then you're not just another bunch of Christians who teach slightly different to what true Christians teach. You are a cult. This whole issue of whether or not we're going to put the teachings of Jesus first before the teachings of everyone else you know, let him be the chief cornerstone? Make him the standard by which you judge every other brick in the building? This sounds like a pretty big essential to salvation to me, doesn't it? Can anyone really accept Jesus? Really believe Jesus? Really profess to be a Christian while at the same time taking him down from the arch? Sliding him out from the rest of the building? And not be guilty of extreme heresy? 
a being a cult? In fact, I can't imagine any issue being more fundamental to our understanding of Christianity than whether or not we are going to teach that Jesus, and that means everything he taught, not Moses, not Solomon, not Paul, not the Pope, not Billy Graham, hey, not even me, unless we are prepared to teach that Jesus is the cornerstone. Our position on his teachings is the absolute bottom line and separating true Christians from all the counterfeits, all the cults, all the heretics. In fact, this issue of whether or not we're going to put Jesus first in every discussion of what it takes to be saved, this issue represents the most essential truth of all human history, the cornerstone of our very existence. Either you're going to accept Jesus and all that he said as being the absolute, infallible Word of God, or you're going to go to hell. The Bible says it quite clearly. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there's no other name under heaven given to the human race by which we must be saved. Am I rambling? I don't think so. At least not yet. I think I'm saying something here that is fundamentally necessary for salvation. And yet, despite that fact, it still has been left out of all so-called Christian denominations in the world. This video is about Jesus being the cornerstone. Yet most of you will listen to it and then not even open your Bibles after you've finished watching it to read what he actually taught. Why? Well, because we don't really care. We're happy to talk profusely about how we're different. Sure, we would not be able to list even a dozen of the things that Jesus told his followers to do, but that doesn't matter. We feel safe because we had a religious experience, or because we know a lot of Bible verses, or because we've been to Bible school. Can you think of any other doctrine in the history of Christianity that ranks higher in importance than this one? The one about the need for Jesus to be consulted and setting the standard for everything else we preach? Remember, in the art of bricklaying, the cornerstone trumps everything else. And in the Christian application of this principle, Jesus, the cornerstone, trumps everyone and every teaching. And here's where I've made, and you can make, the most amazing, the most incredible, and yet the saddest possible discovery. As simple as this one teaching is, it is virtually impossible to get even one person in all of those churches to stop what they are building and what they are preaching long enough to actually listen to Jesus. This is especially true in countries where supposedly Christian churches are on street corners everywhere where whole TV channels broadcast so-called Christian teaching and music 24 hours a day, and where literally billions of Bibles have been produced, each of them containing the teachings of Jesus. They are all convinced that they already know what is needed, even though they never got it from listening to Jesus. Sadly, this also includes most of you. I don't want to offend you unnecessarily, but that's the facts. You're convinced you already have the answers. And so it's virtually impossible to get any of you to actually open up your Bibles and read the teachings of Jesus like you've never read them before. Asking yourself exactly what you are doing right now about obeying any of them. And then comparing that with how Jesus and his first followers lived. One preacher I know of has a really good way of illustrating this. When he lectures, he keeps a pair of dark glasses handy. Each time he tries to teach something new, he picks up the glasses and he says to his audience something like this. This is how the denominations read this passage of scripture. They see only what they have been told to see in their seminaries and in their Bible schools. They are not open to hearing what it's really saying. 
they have been brainwashed by their own denominational traditions. We need to take the glasses off and see what the Bible is really saying. <laughs> but the sad thing is, this same preacher then does exactly the same thing himself. He gives his audience his distortion of the truth. Trust me, this is not an exaggeration. This particular guy starts all of his training courses with instructions not to listen to Jesus if you want to know what a Christian is. He believes that the teachings of Jesus have been replaced by a different gospel. And when he says this, and this is the amazing part, his entire audience nods their heads obediently and then they metaphorically pick up their dark glasses and let him do their thinking for them from that point on. Obviously, he's no worse than all the rest, but what amazes me is that he can do such a great job of illustrating, and others, mind you, only in others, exactly what he himself does from that point on. Consequently, the cornerstone himself goes begging. I know of another group that actually calls themselves Cornerstone something or other. Yet if you go to their website, you'll see nothing about Jesus. Instead, you're introduced to a Bible study program that is outlined like this. The first course of bricks. The second course of bricks. The third course of bricks. It's a clever use of the two meanings for course, but obviously the preliminary to all of the bricks has been left out. You don't start with the first course of bricks. Where's the cornerstone? And that's not so different to what people get everywhere else as well. Brick after brick after brick, but no cornerstone to hold it all together. Ah, uh, somewhere along the line, they all say, Lord, Lord, just like Jesus said they would. But it takes more than a name to hold it all together. Please understand, folks, I'm not straining at a gnat here. I'm talking about the camel of difference between a person who is following Jesus and one who is following someone else. This is not some minor disagreement over an unimportant issue of doctrine. It's all about eternal life versus eternal damnation. I've received lengthy diatribes, including some from teenagers, believe it or not, spouting dozens of arguments against obeying the teachings of Jesus. Some of them include elaborate quotations from the Old Testament and from the writings of Paul, often including explanations about what they say is the proper Greek interpretation of certain words in the King James Bible that do not fit well with the stuff they're preaching. So I challenge them. I say, well, you clearly did not arrive at these conclusions by listening to Jesus. In fact, you did not even arrive at them by reading the Bible. You could read the entire Bible through from cover to cover. 20 times, if you like. And just from reading the Bible, you would not have come to the conclusions you're presenting to me now as your evidence that Jesus didn't expect us to obey him. You got this stuff from someone else and from some other book besides the Bible. Many of them foolishly pretend they didn't, arguing that there's no way that I could ever know where they got it from. Of course there is. There are churches full of professing Christians who do this week after week and year after year. You all tell yourselves and anyone else you think you convince that you're following Jesus when you're obviously not. In a hundred different ways, you have been steered away from the cornerstone. And anyone who's been following Jesus for even a few days will be able to see right through you. Brothers and sisters, this is the greatest conspiracy in the history of the world. It's a major, major, major conspiracy to bury the cornerstone. People write to me trying to get feedback from me on a hundred different topics. And I repeatedly demand that they show some evidence that they have listened to Jesus. I don't mind answering their questions as long as it's related to the teachings of Jesus. I want evidence that they're seriously trying to obey him before I'll even consider moving on to some other topic. And then they write back to me. Dear Voice, I've already read the whole Bible. All I want to know is if you think women should be allowed to preach. Or, of course I'm following Jesus. Who do you think you are? God knows my heart. I just want to know which version of the Bible you use. Or this one. 
I've listened to all of your videos and I agree with everything that you say. Is there a church that believes like you in Chicago? Preferably on the east side, as close as possible to East 100th Street and the Skyway? What are they all saying? They're saying that they have not heard what Jesus told his disciples to do. And how do I know? Because I have heard what Jesus told his disciples to do. It's that easy for anyone who really has listened to Jesus. Anyway, I think I am rambling now. Sorry about that. What I really need to say is that when the topic is obedience to the teachings of Jesus, as it is on this channel, then everything and anything else is almost certainly going to be an attempt by the devil, if not by you who write to me, to avoid the real topic. I've often said that I could have spent my whole life teaching that frogs created the universe, and I would have hundreds, probably thousands of people following me by now. The world's just that gullible. They don't believe anything. Preach it often enough, and you'll find people who believe you no matter what you say. But there is one incredible and amazing supernatural exception. If you preach that the teachings of Jesus are the missing piece that has been left out of every doctrine in the churches today, almost no one will give you the time of day. You can preach it for a lifetime and they'll reject it. Universal and very stubborn opposition to the teachings of Jesus is probably the most reliable and predictable miracle available to the world today. If you want evidence that Jesus was pretty special, go to any church you like and say, can we have a Bible study that starts and finishes with the teachings of Jesus, nothing else? And can we approach that study with the conviction that we need to obey the things that Jesus told his followers to do? Just watch, watch and see what happens. Listen to what I'm saying. I'm putting out a challenge here. Try that in any church in the world. And I can guarantee you're going to face some pretty extreme opposition. Eye-opening opposition. Seriously, I, I think it would be easier to get a congregation to accept a proposal to raise funds for a new church building through prostitution than it would be to get them to put the cornerstone back where he belongs. The best people that I've been able to find in the churches today, fundamentalists, Pentecostal, radicals, all of them, every single one has one teaching they all hold in common. They don't all come right out and say it every time they speak, but in the seminaries, in the Bible schools, and even some of the home Bible studies, they teach that obedience to the teachings of Jesus is optional, that it has nothing to do with salvation. We're talking chief cornerstone here, brothers and sisters. We're talking about taking that cornerstone away and replacing it with a brick, or worse still, with a handful of sand. And they're all saying that obedience to Jesus, putting him before all the theology they picked up through church tradition, is optional. More often than not, they're saying it's downright dangerous. How can they do that? Another preacher uses another good way to illustrate what is happening in the churches. He says to people, and he points to the Bible when he's doing this, he says, can you honestly read this and tell me that what you see here, and he points to a huge building full of thousands of people, is the same thing as that? Truthfully, don't you have this nagging doubt when you're on your own with just you and God and the Bible that something's missing? We need to get it right. It is eternally important to get it right. And he even makes the reference to the odd teaching of Jesus. But he still has to stick in the occasional reminder that I know it doesn't save you. Now, why would he say something like that? It's because if he doesn't say that often enough, he's going to be kicked out and asked not to come back. It has to be made clear if you want to be accepted in those churches that you don't really believe a person's going to go to hell if they disobey Jesus. Now, can you imagine what would happen if he straight out said, if you're not obeying Jesus today, right now, your house is built on sand and it is going to crash unless you do something right now about obeying Jesus. Can you imagine, even in his own home church, what would happen if he said, brothers and sisters, I have to tell you the truth. 
What we are doing here is still not what the early Christians did. They sold everything. Have you? They stopped working for money. Have you? And they went into all the world preaching the gospel. Are you doing that? Now I'm going to walk out that door and start doing it myself. If you want to come with me, that would be great. But if not, at least you have heard the truth. Not some watered-down compromise that only looks radical because it's a few degrees warmer than the lukewarmness that surrounds us. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about what's happening here on A Voice in the Desert. At this stage, there have been over two and a half million downloads on this YouTube channel in the past year. 25,000 people have subscribed to this channel. Thousands of them have written to me. Hundreds of them have said they want to forsake all and live by faith, or words to that effect, as they write to me. But less than 50 of them have actually done it. Quit their jobs, sold all their possessions, traveled thousands of miles to link up with others who are doing the same thing, pulled the resources, and then started living and working together to share the same message day in and day out, on the streets, to literally hundreds of thousands of other people, while doing all they can to help the poor as well. Analyze those statistics. You're going to find out that for every 50,000 downloads in this channel, we are doing well if one of them actually follows through and starts obeying Jesus. If you projected that success rate, one person in 50,000, across the entire world, based on a world population of about 7,220,000,000 people, there might be as many as 144,000 people who would actually follow Jesus. Millions would talk about it. But only about 144,000 people in today's hugely overpopulated world would actually follow the Lamb wherever He goes, like it says in the Bible. But I believe that's exactly the sort of army that God is going to work with in the years ahead. As He turns away from the counterfeits and starts preparing a bride for His return. No more counterfeits. No more cover-ups, no more doctrines and traditions of men. Just honest, humble obedience as we put that cornerstone back up where it belongs. Yes, we'll be imperfect in how we do it, but we will stop making excuses for not even trying to do it perfect. And let me finish by reading what Jesus said about the cornerstone in Matthew chapter 21. It contains a somber and rather frightening warning right at the end of it. Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? That same stone has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say to you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a new nation, one that can be seen in the way that they live. And here it is, the somber warning that I've not so far read. Whoever will fall on this stone will be broken. But, you know, what a huge but this is. But on whoever it falls, presumably when Jesus returns to judge the world, it will grind him to powder. This is not an empty threat. It's coming from the one whom the Bible says was there when God created the universe because he himself is God in some unfathomable way. His teachings, those same teachings that you all keep skirting around and avoiding with a hundred different other topics, replacements, distractions, those same teachings are going to grind you to powder. Is that what you want? I admit the teachings of Jesus do break us when we listen to them and let him change our hearts. They can be difficult at times. But stop telling me that it's too much for God to ask you to give up everything for Him. Day after day, people write and say, I can't obey Jesus because I have kids. Or my wife doesn't agree with me. Or I have a student loan. 
or I can't find anyone in my neighborhood to work with. Or I'm sick or handicapped, or I have a relative who is sick or handicapped. Hey, turn around. Look up, up there, toward the heavens. Can you see a tiny little dot up there? Very high up, but getting closer. It may not yet be close enough for you to even see it with your naked eye. But I'm telling you, it's a huge rock. Perfectly square. And fallibly right. It's the giant cornerstone that created the universe and is headed your way. It's coming to judge the whole world. You, me, everyone. Don't give me any more excuses why it won't work. Don't direct your trivial questions to me. Address them to the cornerstone himself. But do it quickly. Because that giant rock is getting closer every second. And is headed straight toward you. At some point, you won't even need to ask your question. Or voice your excuses. Because you'll see them all for what they are. They are your very own private ticket to hell. All of your double-mindedness, all of your excuses, won't have any effect at all on the momentum of that great cornerstone, which you and millions of other builders are pushing aside day after day. It will grind you to powder. Believe me. Is that what you want? If not, then fall on your face before God today, right now. Beg Him to show you where to start and to give you the courage to do now what will be too late to do when the chief cornerstone himself gets here. If you like, you can write to me too, telling me that you're ready to leave it all, and asking whether there may be someone else in your country that I know of, or in a nearby country, who's also prepared to leave it all. Now, not in four months. The harvest is already overdue. Tell me that you are ready to be broken on the rock of Jesus' teachings and you want to stop making excuses. Ask me if I know anyone, anywhere in the world that you can link up with. Then I'll answer your email. Not because I wouldn't like to strike up a friendship with you and everyone else who writes in, so we can chew the fat until the cows come home. But because that cornerstone is heading toward me too, I want to be found building his kingdom to the best of my ability when he gets here. Hopefully, we can all look forward to his arrival with eager anticipation. Hopefully, he'll be able to say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. In the name of Jesus, the Cornerstone. Amen. <laughs>